Well, welcome everyone to uh, to a really very special uh, grand round. Uh, the hearty few uh, in the audience today who braved those narrow streets and big piles of snow are, are to be commended. I'm sure our WebEx crowd is uh, particularly robust today. Um, it gives me really great uh, uh, pleasure to welcome a, a really a good friend and a uh, both uh, personally and of Children's National, I should mention, uh, back to Children's National uh, for a, a very special uh, grand rounds. Dr. Joshua Sharfstein uh, returns to us today, and he is Associate Dean for Public Health Practice and Training and Faculty in Health Policy and Management at the John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Previously, uh, Josh served as Secretary of the Maryland Department of Health and Mental Hygiene from January 2011 through 2014. And in that position, he was really instrumental in leading efforts to align Maryland's healthcare system with improved health outcomes, culminating in the adoption of a completely revised payment model for hospital care in, uh, uh, for Maryland residents, a, a really uh, a remarkable accomplishment. Josh brings a lot of other really exciting experience to bear uh, for his talk uh, this morning. He previously served as a principal deputy commissioner uh, at the FDA. Prior to that, he was commissioner of uh, health for uh, Baltimore City. Uh, prior to that, he was minority professional staff and health policy advisor for uh, Congressman Harry Waxman uh, himself. Uh, Josh is a fellow of the Institute of Medicine of the National Academy of Public Health Administration and serves on the editorial board uh, of JAMA. So welcome, Dr. Sharfstein. Thank you, Dr. Teach. You left off the most important credential, which is as a fast track position here. Uh, under, under you, you're very, very kind to take me in when I was working on Capitol Hill. Um, thank you. It's, it's great to be here. Um, I, I wasn't sure I would see anyone here after my commute in, uh, which was uh, a little exciting. Um, I was not in danger of falling asleep. It was good that I had seen the Mad Max movie a few days before in order to get down here. Actually, my, uh, and this I promise will be my last joke, um, but the, uh, I do think that given how bad traffic was, there's a chance I won't get one of those speed tickets sent to me. I think there was probably a period where I did shifts here for, for fast track and like 15 straight times I got the speed tickets from uh, North Capitol Street. So I'm hoping since I was going by at four miles an hour this time that it will not happen. Um, and it's great to see Devesh um, uh, Agrawal here. Uh, we were residents together and then um, he's reminded me that he runs the residency program when we were residents uh, we um, had a patient together who um, had been received an overdose of an anti-seizure medicine based on a, a prescription for a old version, uh, a, a concentration, I think, of uh, Dilantin that was um, no longer around and it got filled wrong by the pharmacy and it turned out the program director had written the prescription. Um, and uh, she was very nice and supportive of us writing in a letter and getting the Harriet Lane fixed. But uh, I think uh, that really means it's open season for on, on Duresh uh, as a new as a program director here if he has any uh, any major problems. So um, I am going to talk about uh, the moment in time where we uh, are in healthcare and what I think is a really great opportunity for pediatrics and public health to come together. And I'll be honest with you, I did a talk called otolaryngology and public health, time to tango in the otolaryngology department at Johns Hopkins. It was a harder sell, okay, than pediatrics and public health. I really did my best, and it was an interesting discussion. Um, but uh, this is a much easier talk to give in that regard. So um, I'm going to uh, go through a few things, and feel free to interrupt me, and I will be stopping uh, from time to time. Um, I will also keep uh, my eye on the clock. So we have plenty of time for questions at the end. Um, I, uh, I'm a big person in stopping early. I got a very stern note from Dr. Teach, make sure you stop early, make sure there's time for questions. And I was always very frustrated when I had lectures to go all the way up to the end and not take questions. And there was one time in medical school, and this is a true story, I remember it very well, we had a dermatologist come 
uh, over who just showed probably like 250 slides and kept saying questions at the end. And then at the end, he said, I have no time for questions. And everybody was so aggravated. He'd shown probably every rash that ever existed. And uh, one of my friends who's now an OBGYN in, in Florida raised his hand and said, I have one question you absolutely must answer. And this very formal dermatologist said, what is that? And he said, uh, is acne on the back called bacne? So I thought you deserved that question. So um, there are two perspectives on health. One is the clinical medicine, clinical medicine, the care of the patient. The other, population health, a healthy community. I went back recently to my residency program at um, Boston Medical Center uh, the, and Children's Hospital, the primary care track, and I met with the residents in the primary care track. Incredibly, you know, great, great people. And they were telling me about all these different projects that they're working on. And I said to them, are the, you know, just one question, are, are the kids in the community that you guys are serving getting healthier? And they had no, they couldn't answer that question, right? I mean, they could tell me about all the great programs and how they're reducing admissions or whatever, but are the kids getting out there? How do you even think about that? That's the second perspective. That's like, I'm not so interested in the care, but are the kids getting healthier? And this is a moment for clinical medicine, which has to care about the care, to also think about the health of the community. And this is not, you know, it is really um, a bit of a historical uh, artifact that these things are so separate. It used to be that, you know, the teaching in medicine, um, this is Hippocrates, that you have to think about the, the overall community and factors that implicate community health beyond just the individual patient. And this is Hippocrates talking about how important it is for the physician to consider the seasons of the year um, and the weather in each region. And you had Abraham Flexner, who, you know, the more, the most, uh, traditional of medical education um, uh, people who set up the whole medical education system we have in the United States say that physicians should be uh, focused on protecting the well as well as healing the sick and that physicians have a duty to promote social conditions that support physical well-being. But for most of the 20th century, um, public health and clinical medicine have been ships passing in the night. Pediatrics there are def is probably the field where that has been the least the case, but it's still generally true. Um, clinical medicine concerns itself with the care of populations, insurance coverage, quality, measurement in clinical, on the clinical side, um, public health with things like restaurant inspections, lead poisoning, clean air, clean water, injury prevention. Um, I think that there are some overlaps. Obviously, uh, vaccination is a big, big overlap, um, school health. But um, most people, when they're spending their time in, pe in clinical pediatrics, aren't, are, are very focused on clinical care. And uh, there's a whole world around clinical care. And then you have a whole completely different world around public health. It's true that a lot of people in public health are pediatricians. Um, and uh, that's a great thing for the field of, of pediatrics. But oftentimes, they're pediatricians who no longer really want to have anything to do with clinical medicine. And I met a lot of them um, that way. And, and uh, similarly, um, it's the case that there's a, a whole part of pediatrics, which is very, very focused on making sure you give the best possible care to kids when they're sick and not that focused on, on um, community um, prevention. There have been times in history where people have tried to bring clinical medicine and public health closer together. And um, there was a big effort uh, in about uh, the mid-90s that totally failed. Um, it was written up, and this is a nice way of saying it. It was em embraced in some states and localities, but unable to bridge the cultural and institutional divide in others. So there's something that is fundamentally changing this, and this is um, about all of medicine, but it particularly, I think, creates opportunities for pediatrics. Um, the first fundamental thing to understand is how expensive healthcare is and what that is really um, doing to people's uh, perspectives on um, the healthcare system. So when I say healthcare is too expensive, uh, what do I mean? I'm going to take a couple questions here. In, uh, what's a way of thinking about healthcare being too expensive? Like uh, people say that a lot. What do I mean by that? Too expensive for who? The value proposition that quality costs. I don't. 
I don't. I just mean too expensive, too too costly. I'll get. I'm going to be talking about value a little bit, but like, what does it mean to think that healthcare is too expensive? Our per, our per capita costs are, are certainly high given given our health. That's true, um, but too expensive. What? Um, I see. Government's oh. paying too much money for. Okay, that, I think I think that's so. One side of too expensive is that the government's share is unaffordable, at, or at least creating huge budget pressures. And is that happening at the federal government now for health care? Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to show this second one here. How many people have seen that graph, the, um, the one with the health care spending going up? That's a very uh, good graph to understand. That's the budget outlook, basically the debt till 2050. The only thing going up is healthcare spending. So the entire budget debate, essentially, in Washington is about healthcare spending. And then if you look at states, this is, I just pulled this from Maryland, um, this is a relative increase in different parts of the state budget. Um, the red line is healthcare, which is state employees and Medicaid primarily. And it's, it's outstripping everything in the budget. Maryland's obviously not unique. Um, and those other lines are like education, public safety, infrastructure, all growing far left. This is what this graph is, is just starting from a frozen point in 2001, the relative increase in the budget. So you see healthcare just growing much faster. So it's more, it's too, becoming too expensive for state governments. That's why you're seeing, you know, um, huge uh, fights over Medicaid expansion. Um, it's very expensive for the federal government. And then this first one is just about just to remind me to talk about, it's expensive for families, right? Like people who have to pay for health care. And even if their insurance premiums are staying the same, what's going up? Okay. The deductibles and copays, right? So you can't just look at premiums. And in fact, in Maryland, I think two thirds of the new plans uh, being offered in the small group market are high deductible plans. People have to pay like $5,000 out of pocket before they get any benefits. It's just a huge, um, huge cost shift to people. And then they, when they get sick, they can't afford care. So you have um, all these fundamental trends making it very, very hard um, for people to still afford health care. And then to Dr. Teach's point, we're not getting great outcomes for it. And here are just a few slides on this. You've probably seen them, but these are my favorite ones. This is a study that we, or a project that I worked on when I was a city health commissioner in Baltimore where we looked at life expectancy by neighborhood. And uh, we found more than a 20 year gap across the city of Baltimore within a couple miles, 20 year life expectancy gap. Holland's Market, about 62 years. Roland Park, about 85. Um, and uh, the, the kind of disparities that exist in the United States are pretty staggering for health, and overall our health outcomes aren't that great. Um, this is just a recent National Academy of Medicine study. Um, in case you haven't seen it, it shows what has happened to life expectancy between the people born in 1930 and the people born in 1960. And this is for men, um, and you see that there's no improvement for the first two quintiles of income. The only improvement is really as you get to the richer, um, richer men. And if you look for women, it's only the top quintile that has expanded life expectancy between the people born in 1930 and 1960. Think of how much money we spend in healthcare, and 80% of the women, based on income, are not improving their life expectancy. And if you look at quintile one, they're losing here. Of course, women are living less long than before. Um, <laughs> Uh, this is just, I just thought this was such an interesting graph to show. This is also from the National Academy of Medicine. If you go back to 1980, that red dot is where um, female life expectancy is relative to other countries. Um, and you see we're kind of in the middle of the pack. If you go out to, by, by the mid-2000s, we're the lowest. We've lost ground internationally in, in life expectancy for women just over the last 25 years as we're spending trillions of dollars in healthcare. And this is men, same story, absolute lowest among all our, you know, peer countries in life expectancy. So we basically have an incredibly expensive healthcare system that's straining state federal budgets tremendously. People are starting not to be able to afford care in a lot of, in a lot of places. 
and our outcomes are poor, we have huge disparities. And that is what is behind. You have to understand those two fundamental facts, to understand why, what is going on in terms of the major changes happening in, in healthcare. That um, people have, there's basically a tipping point has been reached, I think, in healthcare where um, something has got to change. And the approach, particularly that the Affordable Care Act pushes and the Obama administration has been very um, strongly supportive of is uh, payment reform, which is saying maybe the reason that we have such um, poor outcomes and high costs is because we're paying for, for on a fee-for-service basis. Now, when I was the health, uh, health secretary of Maryland, I got invited once to the ecumenical council in, uh, in Baltimore. And I, I never met with them. They were sort of a regional group. I never met with them when I was health commissioner. And I was late. It might have been snowing. I have a feeling it might have been snowing that day. But anyway, I was late. And I never met with the ecumenical council. And I walked in. And I felt guilty already. And like they were like 12 men. They were all men, all in clerical attire sitting around a rectangular table in a pretty harsh-looking room, and they looked at me like I was coming to church late, or at least what I imagined it would look like to come to church late. So I was there. I was just like, I was on the defensive from the moment I sat down. And they asked me all kinds of questions about the Affordable Care Act and the exchanges, and we were talking, talking, talking. Finally, one of the, and you know, when I'm talking, I'm trying to like make a connection with someone, like to understand what I'm saying and those sorts of things, and I'm getting nothing, right? I'm getting like nothing from them. It's a very question, answer, question, answer, question, answer. So finally, they go, why is healthcare so expensive? And I said, well, you know, there's tobacco and there's obesity, and the truth is tobacco rates are coming down and cardiovascular risk factors are coming down, but healthcare, you know, is still going up in cost, and there's a lot to do with the way we pay for things. If we pay for every single heart failure admission, we're going to get a lot of heart failure admissions. If we pay for every asthma visit in the ER, we're going to get a lot of asthma visits in the ER. Um, and I'm still getting nothing from them. So I said, it's as if if you guys were paid by the prayer. And there was like this really long silence. Like my career flashed before my eyes. <laughs> um, and one of, the, one of the ministers who was there, who was sitting across from me at this table, who had like this long, thin face and pointy nose, and in my recollection was wearing a cape, but might not have actually been wearing a cape, to be perfectly honest. He leaned across the table, put his hand on my hand, bowed his head slightly, and said, let us pray. <laughs> so they understood, right? If you're going, that's a true story, if you're going to be paying for everything, you're going to get a lot of it, and it may not matter for health. So there's a huge push now for payment reform, and that is dramatically changing healthcare, not uniformly at the same speed everywhere, but in a lot of places, and there's huge opportunities in that. This is uh, Secretary Burwell. She set a goal of 50% of Medicare payments being off of fee-for-service by 2018. Um, and she's talking about a healthcare system that uh, achieves the triple eight in better health, uh, better care, and lower cost. So there are different, um, models on how to do that in pediatrics. Um, pediatrics uh, has, a ch has a, on the one hand, has the challenge that it's obviously a relatively small expense compared to the whole healthcare um, uh, enterprise. On the other hand, it, it gives it some flexibility to do things that are different. And I will, um, I, as I go through this, try to be a little provocative, but you're certainly familiar with medical homes, a concept that pretty much was invented in pediatrics. But, you know, some of the more aggressive models are going to be paying medical homes a lot better for uh, better outcomes for kids and giving medical homes the ability to um, invest in different types of projects that keep kids out of the hospital. So instead of having a medical home where everything's paid fee for service, and you're trying to, you know, patch it together to keep the kids healthy, you give a big bonus to the medical home that they can keep their, you know, their admissions below a benchmark by keeping kids healthy and put in place programs that really work. In Maryland, as Dr. Teach said, we um, ended fee-for-service hospital care for the most part. Um, and uh, I'm happy to answer questions about that if people are, as we get into it, interested. But I'll give you, like, the really quick, um, uh, quick, explanation. Maryland for 40 years has set hospital rates. It's the only state that does that now. We have an independent commission that essentially gives a rate card to every hospital. And not all the hospitals 
the hospitals all have different rate cards. It depends on their cost structure. But every payer pays off that rate card. Medicare pays the same rate as Blue Cross, pays the same rate as Kaiser, pays the same rate as Medicaid for the hospital services. So every other state, Medicaid's like at 60%, 70% of reimbursement, and Blue Cross is at 140% of, you know, cost. Maryland is all essentially the same. They're just minor variations that aren't worth getting into. But they're basically all paying the same cost. And um, that's a system that did a lot of great things in Maryland. Um, it, for example, there was a surcharge put on every single bill to pay for uncompensated care, and then there was a pool for uncompensated care funding, and it went back out to all the hospitals. So that's one reason why there are no public hospitals in Maryland, um, because people could get reimbursed for uncompensated care everywhere. All payers paid for medical education expenses because they were built into that rate card that a hospital would get if they had medical education. But there were problems with the system. Um, the, the federal government only participated. Uh, you think, um, you know, there was a lot of extra money coming in through Medicare because our rates were higher than the national Medicare rates. So Medicare set a condition, which is that our prices couldn't go up faster than the national rate of growth in prices. So we were constantly keeping our, trying to keep our price growth down. And when you try to keep price growth down in a fee-for-service system, what happens to volumes? Up. Right? It's, I say, like, if you can only make $2 on a pair of pants, you have to sell a lot of pants. So Maryland had some of the highest admission rates of any place in the country, number one in readmissions to Medicare for quite a period. Um, and uh, that's not a great thing for health, to have a ton of hospital admissions. So it was optimized for some things, but not for others. And as luck had it, when I started as secretary, the system nearly collapsed because we weren't able to keep the prices below the benchmark the federal government required. And so we had to renegotiate the whole thing with the federal government. That was the 18-month process um, that culminated with a very different approach to hospital payment, where the hospitals are essentially given global budgets, which means a year in advance, they know how much they're going to get paid. No matter how many admissions, how many year visits, how many MRIs, they know. And if they can prevent admissions, they get to keep the difference. And um, this is not just for Medicaid, not just for Medicare. This is the entire hospital for its Maryland patients. And for some of the smaller hospitals, they just do it for the whole hospital. So that's just a fundamentally different incentive for the hospital. So think about what that means for your asthma you know, patients. If you're going to get, you know what it is, you're going to get paid in advance, you can shift to programs that will really prevent asthma. I know Dr. Teach is fabulous work in this area, and actually have that be a money maker for the hospital instead of a money loser for the hospital where you're doing things the right way. Um, and so I'm happy to answer more questions about that, but it opens up a lot of different exciting things. One of the things that it opens up and um, is re better approaches to regionalization of services. One of the challenges that happens when you have these small hospitals that need to survive and are having, and it, you know, um, Governor O'Malley used to say, we don't want to pay hospitals like hotels where they have to keep the beds filled. Well, if you've got a little hospital somewhere and you're struggling, you know, there are a lot of those little hospitals that have suddenly decided that they should be doing hip replacements. You know, that's not a great thing for the population because they're not doing that many of them. In pediatrics, it looks like maybe holding on to the NICU babies a little too long uh, when they should be transferring them. But you put them on a global budget, they want to get those sickest patients out, and that's probably better for the sickest patients that they come to places like Children's or, or Hopkins or other, or, or other tertiary institutions. So I think that there's an implication for child health in this that isn't a bad one, as long as you can adjust the incentives to appropriately pay the referral hospitals. Um, there are other uh, pediatric models we can talk about, but the basic concept that all of them have is um, that the healthcare organization makes more of a margin we call profit if you were for profit, but more of a margin if your patients are healthier. That's what we may consider the holy grail of healthcare payment reform, that if your patients are healthier, you get rewarded, and therefore you're able to invest in things to keep your patients and the community healthier. And so um, what I would like to do is talk about where public health fits in. So um, what is public health? Uh, we're in the centennial year, uh, as you can tell from the bottom of my slide, the big 100. The fact that our school is 100 years old is not an anniversary that has gone unnoticed. The Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health is sort of plastered everywhere, um, including on my slides here. Um, but, uh, and the, you know, the, uh, 
the history of that very briefly is that uh, John Rockefeller wanted to have a school of public health when he was deciding between Harvard and Columbia. And he asked uh, William Welch from Johns Hopkins to um, advise him on whether to start the school at Harvard or Columbia. He was sort of the original Dick Cheney um, in terms of that. So um, the report that was filed basically said that um, public health, the unity, that the, the concept of public health is to be found in the end to be accomplished, the preservation and improvement of health, rather than in the means uh, essential to that end. Um, and uh, interestingly, why did Hopkins get the School of Public Health? It's because the report that William Welch wrote for John Rockefeller said the most important thing in the success of the School of Public Health is having employed physicians at the affiliated hospital, because that otherwise doctors will just not engage at all, and you'll be just in the margins of health if you're trying to deal just with sanitarians. Don't do that. This is what William Wells said. You have to be really engaged in healthcare to produce health, and for that, you need the hospitals to demand that the doctors participate, and it's just a total waste of money unless you put uh, a school of public health next to a hospital that employs its physicians. And Rockefeller was like, that makes total sense. Well, which is it, Harvard or Columbia? And he was like, actually, only Hopkins employs its physicians. And that's how they got it. But from the beginning, the field has had this interesting relationship with healthcare. Um, the Institute of Medicine defines public health as what we as a society do collectively to assure the conditions in which people can be healthy. There are core functions of public health, which you can read about online, you know, including emergency preparedness, evaluation, community partnerships. Um, there's a lot on that online. This is another picture which talks about the determinants of health, where you see access to quality health care just being one part of this at the bottom. Um, and uh, the physical environment, the social environment, and policies have a huge impact. So if you're now, if your goal in healthcare is to reduce um, admission, you have to think more about the patients you, than, than about the patients you know about. You have to think about the whole community and who may be coming to the hospital. And that's where public health becomes a very interesting partner. I found that a lot of people don't have an intuitive understanding of how public health adds to health care. And, you know, you think about public health, most people think, oh, well, public health, you know, like vaccines, that's good. It's sort of a clinical prevention model. Most people think about clinical prevention. But public health goes way beyond that, and that's where there's this new potential for collaboration around different financial incentives. So um, I'm going to switch to some examples here. Who knows what that picture is? Yeah. Correct, the Broad Street pump. So this is the um, you know, cholera outbreak. And uh, uh, John Snow figures out that all the cases are bunched around the pump. And um, so he puts in place uh, quality of care protocols at all the emergency departments. And through oral rehydration, they save all the, no, no, no. What did he do? Yes. He took the handle of the pump off, right? So that's a public health tool, not a clinical tool, an, an environmental health intervention. Um, this is a a graph of the impact of taxes on uh, tobacco consumption. I think it's in um, Hong Kong. And you see that, you know, you can do an awful lot clinically, and you can counsel till you're blue in the face, but the tax really helps to convince people not to smoke, right? A different kind of tool that can come together with, in concert with clinical tools. Um, this is a, a chart that our, our part of the research of our, our dean, Mike Clagg at, at Hopkins, um, where they looked at, he looked at hypertension among the same, essentially the same people from a demographic point of view, some of whom stayed farmers, some of whom migrated to the city, and he saw a phenomenal increase in hypertension among the migrants. So, you know, insights into what's going on in problems that you really can't get just from clinical medicine. Just if you're just taking care of the migrants in the city, you don't really understand what's behind it unless you have a kind of a public health perspective. And I'd like to give you a specific example of um, infant sleep-related deaths in Baltimore. Um, so I'm the health commissioner of Baltimore, and the worst job, worst maybe, the, the most difficult, Part of that job was to chair the child fatality review every month. That's an interdisciplinary meeting where we would look at every unexplained death of, of childhood in the city of Baltimore. And I'm sure that happens in uh, D.C. and that there's, I don't know, 
uh, somewhat related to that or directly related to that. In Baltimore, I, I ran that. I was very interested in understanding what the policy implications were. Some of you may know when I was health commissioner, um, I led a, a petition to the Food and Drug Administration after four kids through the child fatality review, we identified four kids who died um, because of cough and cold uh, medication overdoses that were inadvertent. And based on that, we pulled all the pediatric uh, chiefs together in Baltimore and we petitioned the FDA. And that's why um, there are no baby cough and cold medicines on the market anymore. Um, actually up to age four, they were relabeled. Our original petition was up to age six. We we're happy to get up to age four off the market. Um, that came out of uh, the child fatality review. Well, one of the other things we saw was the number of babies that were dying in unsafe sleep. I once did a press release. I think it was like 25 babies die every year in Baltimore. And I think in that press release, every single one African-American in unsafe sleep, a huge contributor to um, the racial disparity and in infant mortality that uh, existed in Baltimore and exists in Baltimore. And um, in every way, you know, in the wrong position in bed, not in bed, um, I mean, in the crib, not in the crib. And it was just a horrible, horrible thing. Nobody covered the press release. And we tried everything to reduce those numbers. We um, gave every baby born in the city of Baltimore like a onesie that says, you know, if I'm sleeping, turn me over. I wrote letters to every hospital every time a baby died to the nursery. And I said, I just want you to know this baby that you discharged died. You know, this wasn't a blaming kind of thing. Please use this letter. Please tell your staff to reinforce the importance of safe sleep counseling. And, you know, I got very good feedback from the, from the nurseries. Could not budge the numbers. Everything we did, though, came through the medical system. We were thinking kind of a, more with our medical hat. But public health has these other tools, just like pulling the, you know, the handle off the pump or doing taxes. There are other tools the public health has. And so we actually turned to the School of Public Health that designed a communications campaign that was based around uh, people in Baltimore and interviewed a lot of people in Baltimore. And I hope that we'll be able to get this to work. I think it was my mistake. I did not ask. Do you guys have, is there going to be audio if I play this? Oh, I'm going to watch on YouTube. How many people have seen this? I'm Ayanna Williams. I have one daughter. She's 12 years old, and I had a younger son. He would have been 11 months old. His name is Brandon Lawson. My name is Deara, and I live in the northern part of Baltimore. I have a husband, three children, four-year-old. His name is Eugene. I have a one-year-old. Her name is Sanaya. And I had a baby boy. His name was Charlie. My name is Lottie Sumley. My son was born in Baltimore, Maryland on November 12, 2009. My son's name was William Woodford. I basically got a phone call from another family member that was living in the house that the ambulance was at the um, home trying to resuscitate the baby and that they were rushing him to Hopkins. He was not in his crib, he was in the bed, in our bed. When I woke up at 4.30, he was gone. We had found him dead in the middle of our bed. On December 29th, Charlie passed away. Um, he turned a month that day, that morning. He was in the bed with us. Um, and when I woke up and looked over at him, he just wasn't breathing. If I had a chance to go back to December 29th, knowing what I know now, I probably would have changed a lot of things. I have a seven-month-old baby, and I learned um, when I went to his doctor for his first appointment that all the babies need to sleep safe. That means alone, no parents, no brothers or sisters, on his back, not on his tummy, and in the crib. So that, those, um, those videos, Oh, there we go. Um, 
those videos were shown all over the city. They were shown in the social service offices, in the jury rooms, on TV, um, and we saw a significant jump in improved safe sleep, sleeping, you know, kind of related um, activities, and we saw the first uh, significant decline in um, sleep-related deaths, or about half of what they used to be in Baltimore. And it took switching from, and there have been a lot of other projects that have been done. There's a big focus on uh, the role of fathers, a big focus on smoking cessation. Um, but, it, and, but as a result, um, the infant mortality rate reached an all-time low. Uh, the racial disparity in infant mortality is, came down somewhat, um, the first progress that Baltimore had seen in quite a long time. Um, and it came because we thought to bring some of the tools of public health really to play in addition to different clinical interventions. So how do these things come together? I'm going to throw out a bunch of ideas and then I'll stop for questions. So um, your Children's is a fabulous uh, in, institution and health system, and you pioneered so many great um, aspects of prevention in addition to the highest quality tertiary and quaternary clinical care. Uh, I think as the different um, financial incentives, like as I was starting, and imperatives to improve health in order to get better um, uh, financial uh, success come to bear on the hospital. Um, this hospital, other hospitals, there are different stages of engagement it's, it, that, that hospitals go through. And as I was saying um, earlier, I, I've had a, a little bit of experience this year consulting with hospital systems around the country, so I see them in different stages of thinking about how you adapt to this new environment. How do you, you know, partner with public health. And I think there's a really great opportunity that we're just starting to scratch the surface of that I'm going to talk about. So stage one is trying to do it all yourself. You know, you're now paid a global budget, you know, let's take, do we need home visitors? Let's hire home visitors. Let's, you know, let's, do we need a home health program? Let's create a home health program. Do we need a nutrition program? Let's create a nutrition program. So there's a lot of activity for hospitals to build out and health systems to build out other types of services. Stage two is coordinating a bit more with others, saying, well, maybe we can hire case uh, community health workers from a community health partner, or we can have a relationship with them, or, um, and uh, think about using the community benefits plan to support great work that's going on in communities. I mean, I'm in favor of all these stages. You know, I think, I think health systems do need to grow their set of services, and I do think they should be thinking about how to partner with people in the community, community groups that are, that are doing um, work that relates to health. But I do think there's this opportunity now to leverage the healthcare data to reshape efforts on population health. And this is my last point. I'm going to show a bunch of examples. Um, public health data is very, um, uh, is not very timely. Typically, you're looking at vital statistics data that is available six months after the end of the year. Um, I was looking at the DC Alliance site, um, and it's, it has a ton of data. It's old, though. I mean, it's old. If you guys are doing a central line infection quality improvement project, you're finding out every day or every week whether there's central line infections. But if you're trying to improve the health of, uh, and you're looking at you know, um, obesity or maybe that's not a great example, infant mortality, you could be looking at data that's two years old. And so it's very, very hard to have a community effort that's really aligned for rapid uh, data. But that is changing because of um, the availability of electronic health data, and that's the opportunity. So um, a lot of times when I'm talking to health executives, they think I'm going to tell them they just need to write bigger checks to community groups. I don't object to that. But what I'm actually telling them is that um, there's this enormous opportunity to bring some of the data that you have available and use it. It, it is so helpful on the community health side because it allows them to have more effective efforts to advocate better for more resources on the community health side and for there to be a natural partnership between healthcare and public health. This just shows that um, there's a lot of electronic health data. Um, there's been an enormous federal investment in electronic health data. And I will be the first one to say that the first use of healthcare data is to improve clinical care. You know, data sharing, quality improvement. But there's a second use of health data that's totally underutilized right now, which is to better understand community health by mapping, combining with other data sources, 
targeting community interventions, bring in these other tools that public health has to solve problems, healthcare can flip the light on about problems that are existing in the community and can really um, be the basis, that data sharing can be the basis, I think, of a very strong and different kind of relationship. And the key to thinking about that is pivoting in thinking about your health data about your, from your patient. You're pivoting from your patient or from a population of patients to the community. So instead of saying, here's our admission rate, I want to keep this patient out of the hospital for asthma. I know you do want to do that, which is good. Even I want to keep all our asthmatics out of the hospital. It's to say, we want to keep all the children with asthma in this part of D.C., which has been a hot spot. We want to solve that problem. What are the clinical things we can do in the hospital? What are the public health things we can do? Are there environmental issues? How do we attack that problem? And how do we take our healthcare data and reflect it back to the public health side to come together? So infant mortality, you know, you can make these maps that are very, very local. It often takes years. Um, but why not do that with pre, uh, prematurity or low birth weight and um, be able to put together uh, data that becomes available very frequently, weekly. Um, this is a, a map at Cincinnati children, mapped hotspots and cold spots of pneumonia admissions by geography, because they're um, probably similar to you all, pretty much the only place kids with pneumonia go in their city. And so they looked geographically, and they saw that there was a part of town that is um, high rates of pneumonia. Now, if you think about that on from the clinical side, Go back to my two ships passing in the night. The clinical side, well, what do you do? Well, you want to make sure all the kids that you see are, are vaccinated in the clinic, and maybe, you, you know, you want to do quality of care improvement for initial diagnosis of respiratory distress in the clinic. But a lot of those kids may not be coming into the system until they're really sick. And part of the solution when you look at a map like that is what's going on in those neighborhoods, you know, are there ways that we can uh, improve access to care, improve vaccination rates, improve understanding, reduce certain environmental exposures that, that make um, a, a pneumonia worse? And um, they did this once in, in Cincinnati and published the paper, but they could be doing this, and you could be doing this every week, you know, in coordination with public health. The point isn't that every community intervention is the responsibility of the health system, but that by shining the light on what is possible, you can really lead to the transformation, I think, of what, what happens on the community side. Um, this was uh, about pneumonia. This is actual data from Maryland. Um, Maryland um, has a phenomenal health information exchange called CRISP. How many people here have heard of CRISP? How many people here have looked up data in CRISP? Okay, that's good. Um, when I'm in Maryland um, at, at, say, internal medicine conference, everyone raises their hand. Okay. Um, CRISP is now a verb. People say, you know, uh, have you CRISPed the patient yet, you know, in Maryland? And um, that means, look, that's really about the query portal. That's that first use of electronic health data. But in, uh, in Maryland, we map, we can map all the diagnoses at any level geographically. Um, that capacity exists. And so you could look and say, where are the hotspots for dental ER visits on a population basis. This isn't an absolute number. This is as a rate of population, regardless of where the people are going to the hospital. And you can see that there are hotspots on the Eastern Shore and in Baltimore. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't say that, like, when Children's National really participates, Children's, uh, Chris has its umbrella over D.C. with the exception of Children's National right now. And bringing Children's National on board will be a huge, huge win for kids because then you'll be able to see where the kids are going no matter where um, they wind up in the hospital. But for um, this is uh, an example of what you can look at um, for dental. That gives you a sense, well, where should we be putting our oral health initiatives? Where should we be immediately looking into what problems could happen? Well, you can use healthcare data to do that. This is asthma um, in Western Maryland, and this is the rate of asthma in this one uh, zip code by uh, 1,000 residents, very high. And then two years later, it's come way down. And um, what happened there was that uh, this was a hospital that was on a pilot version of the global budget system. And they, there was a, a weird dispute that happened between the health department and the school system over the school nurses. And the hospital stepped in and said, we'll run the whole school health program. 
And I called the hospital CEO and I said, why are you running the school health program? And he said, um, because we're looking at our data under our global budget, we have so many kids coming in for asthma. We're realizing how much money we're losing. We thought we could run school health at break even, really focus on asthma and make a ton of money on the back end. He didn't say it quite this way. Make money on the back end um, under our global budget. And that's what he did. So, you know, you can see, and, and so you'd say, oh, no, no, no. Well, maybe the kids aren't coming to his hospital. They're just going to Hopkins. Kids with asthma probably aren't driving two hours to Hopkins, but this data is population-based data. We'd see them if they were coming to Hopkins. Um, so you can do a lot more. I mean, we're just scratching the surface in Maryland of what's possible, but you could take that data and a public health department could look all the way down to the block level and see where environmental hotspots might be and look at whether um, it overlaps with code violations or with um, infestation or other problems. And you could be doing that not based on data from three years ago, but based on data from, from last week or the week before. So um, I do think that health information exchange is really important to public health and healthcare coming together. Um, in Maryland, you can look at the very detailed utilization of people who go to multiple hospitals. So any one hospital system might not see them, but um, you can see all the frequent utilizers in Maryland and what they're doing so that they can be um, outreached. Um, actually, that's one of the strategies Maryland's using to succeed under global budgets is all the hospitals are working together to identify through the health information exchange the people who are, are the, the real uh, high utilizers across institutions and make sure that somebody is, is out there uh, trying to help them. You can look at chronic condition prevalence. You can look at very quickly interventions that may be done on a population basis, a geographic basis, a clinical basis, and see whether they're having an outcome and not just be looking at your own hospital system. I think that um, there are many diagnoses that you can map in healthcare and um, have huge implications outside the hospital. Um, and uh, there is the incentive to do it. As the financial pieces fall in place, and I'm not sure exactly where Children's National is in terms of the financial pieces to align payment for health. As I said, it was hap it's happening at different speeds. But as those pieces fall into place, you're getting subcapitated risk, for example. You're getting paid on a a lump sum for patients, for certain patients, or, you know, you, you move to a global budget or, you know, any of these other types of arrangements. As that happens, you have this incredible opportunity to think about different kinds of partnerships with public health and using your data to, to catalyze them. Um, I think that in this new world, you see um, competitors working together in Maryland even though there is competition between hospitals, everybody benefits as preventable admissions go down. In pediatrics, this has a very special um, flavor to it because, you know, it might be said that there is a surplus of certain specialty services in the Baltimore, Washington area because we have multiple academic institutions. And, you know, uh, that nobody is designing our system of tertiary care for kids around the idea that it's going to lead for the best outcomes for kids. They're designing it around having great programs at different institutions. Well, let's just take a hypothetical service line and say Maryland's doing 50 of them, Children's is doing 100 of them, and Hopkins is doing 50 of them. Maybe it'd be better if there were 200 at one place and there was one service. Well, um, maybe we don't need 200 of them even. You know, um, maybe it's we really need 175, but everybody's trying to stay busy. And if you had a global budget and you had different incentives, then people could actually come together. So, you know, it opens up the possibility of collaboration for everyone to win. I also think that there's this incredible opportunity to work with public health and to reel in the pediatricians who are out there in public health and make sure that they're really engaged with um, the pediatric care system around problems. You know, there's a vision of public health which says, we should just exist outside healthcare. I've never subscribed to that. I think that um, most public health officials will be very excited to hear from a healthcare system that wants the public health system to orient to the outcomes that really matter for kids, like um, the suffering that you all see and take care of every day. Um, and so I'll just end by saying I think that uh, this is a unique time for these kinds of collaborations. They're possible, they're financially advantageous. 
um, and they're really interesting and compelling to, to put together. I once did, did grand rounds maybe a decade ago at, at Hopkins, and all the residents were falling asleep in front of me, and I said, um, wouldn't it be amazing? I'm trying to keep them awake. If when you guys went on rounds, it wasn't just the world-famous diagnostic rounds that started at Hopkins, but that you went on rounds and said, what would it really take for these patients to stay out of the hospital and not need to come back? And everybody just sort of looked at me, and I said, the day will come when that actually becomes uh, supported, and just think how fun that will be. That, you know, I mean, and I, I know the groundbreaking work that this hospital has done. If it's incentivized, if it's supported, there's so much room for innovation and expansion and careers and academics and in practice that can uh, improve the lives of, of kids. Um, it's really an exciting time. Thank you very much. Uh, thank all the people. So questions? Josh, I'll, I'll lead off with just one a very specific question, which is um, you you used a term which was really interesting. That was to CRISP a patient, and it's a very practical application of how this, these data may be used. Can you talk a little bit about what it means to CRISP a patient and how you can use that public health tool almost in real time? Sure. Um, so um, there's a query function that the Health Information Exchange has, so you can look up and see whether any particular patient has been in any hospital that's covered by CRISP in D.C. or Maryland. So if you see a patient, say, here from Maryland with asthma, and they're not in your system, you could crisp them and say, whoa, they've had six admissions at Prince George's, you know, or six ER visits at Prince George's Hospital, you know, in the last two months. You know, that just gives you a different sense of what, what's going on. Um, and uh, you can look up labs. You can look up uh, radiology. So it's become part of clinical practice. Um, the other aspect of CRISP that is, is pretty cool is that you can upload your patient list and the instant your patient, any of your patients, 2,000 patients, any one of them shows up at an ER, you can, you can sign up for a secure message that says your patient is in this ER while they're still in the ER registering because they picked up a feed from the hospital. And Maryland sends out 800,000 of those messages a month now. Um, the other thing that Chris does for practices is it will give a dashboard to each practice of all the hospital utilization, ER and inpatient, of all of their patients across all the Chris hospitals. So you don't have to wonder, like, who are my high utilizers? You know, who are the patients I need to be worried about? You can just go to an up. It's not like based on claims data from a year ago. It's based on up to the instant hospital feeds. These are the patients, these are the people who've been in the hospital the most the last six months, the last year, for example. Um, yeah. Sorry, to go off that, is that data automatically uploading from your EHR into Chris, or are there people individually for pulling that data? Right, so um, there's this bunker, 20 floors underground. No, 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 okay. So the, the way. The way it works is it's actually not from the EHRs, some of that instantaneous stuff. There's something called an ADT feed. Have you guys heard of ADT feeds? ADT feeds are really, really cool. If, if you walk into a hospital and the person comes around and goes, like, give me your insurance card, what are you here for? Just the basic things, they type it into the registration system of the hospital. The registration system creates an ADT feed that is then used to open a medical record, open a lab file, open this. It's within the hospital. Those feeds are what support all the electronic infrastructure. It's a very simple message. What Chris does is it copies that. At the moment it's going over to create a medical record for someone, it's being sent centrally, and they're matching that with the, the list that people have um, uploaded, essentially, to Chris. Some of that is very easy to upload. It's automatically generated. You're not, they do ask who's your primary care doctor, but they're not relying on the patient's recollection because a lot of people can't remember. They're relying on the clinician to have claimed the patient. And so you see a huge number of matches. And there, there are stories like a, a woman knew her father had been in a car accident. She didn't know what was going on. She called his doctor and he said, oh, I just got a note. He's in, you know, um, Union Memorial. You know, and so... You get real-time access to your patient's um, information, and that those same feeds then populate the dashboards. And then what Chris does is that they get the, the uh, discharge um, diagnosis, and they match that in, too. So you see the visit and the discharge diagnosis. That takes a couple weeks. Yeah. 
I'd like to I'd like to play a little bit of devil's advocate. Good. Let's say that Dr. Teach's program is wonderful in terms of impact, uh, in terms of the asthma kids and all the ambulatory doctors are great in handling the patients with asthma. So we keep them out of the hospital, we keep them out of the emergency room. So it costs a lot less to take care of these patients. Isn't the hospital going to suffer because they won't have as much income uh, from these patients that are admitted? And therefore, is not the amount of money that the hospital or the, or the HMO gets going to be less because they've done such a good job for the kids? Well, you've you've described the problem of American medicine for the last, you know that that is the dilemma of traditional fee for service medicine. So, in Maryland, that incentive is gone. That problem is gone because if those kids don't show up at the hospital, the hospital still gets paid its global budget. Nobody's pulling money out. The incentive is fundamentally different in Maryland for Maryland kids. Now, that's not the case for your hospital because you're not in Maryland. You're not part of a rate setting system. But there are other ways outside of Maryland for hospitals to put themselves in a position where you don't have that problem. That is the opportunity. That's what Sylvia Burwell and HHS are trying to push. But it really does depend on hospital leadership, the market, all these different factors. Um, you know, a lot of hospitals offer, you know, Montefiore is a hospital in the Bronx that is doing its best to, um, they, they, not only do they have their own managed care plan and Medicaid, they will subcontract to other managed care plans and to commercial insurers for like 94% of premium. So they get basically paid a big amount of money for their population of patients, and then they can put in place a lot of prevention well, activities. Well, great payments be going down if you're doing such a good job. Um, the, um, n n not if you have a policy that says if you're preventing admissions, like there's a whole separate discussion on how you make sure that this is done correctly. So let's just jump over that and say we know that this hospital is doing great work and the reason they have lower admissions than last year is because they're preventing them. There's, you know, Maryland there's an independent commission that sets the global budget. You're going to, you know, you're just not going to grow as fast, but you're going to have a better financial margin. And the hospitals that have succeeded under the global budget are doing better financially. The one hospital um, in Western Maryland has had like a one-third reduction in admissions, and they have a clinic you can go to, asthma, heart failure, diabetes. Anyone in the county gets a full multidisciplinary team support as often as they want to come. They've shut down wards of the hospital because they're just preventing all these admissions. There is so much, particularly in adult medicine, low-hanging fruit in terms of prevention um, when you go from a discoordinated system to a system that tries to keep people out of the hospital. Yeah. Uh, Josh, the, there's uh, an old statement that the uh, Wolf Street is the broadest street in uh, in Baltimore, this mm -hmm. street that separates the School of Public Health and the clinical activities. Can you give us an example of how Hopkins has been able potentially to collaborate and and uh, enact some of these programs that you're talking about? Sure, and I'm I'm not. My appointment isn't at the School of Medicine. Um, I mean, isn't at the, the hospital, but uh, there are a number of really interesting projects going on at Hopkins. The pediatrics department is uh, launching a big community health worker project, and there's um, discussions with some of the environmental advocates um, that have kind of surfaced from time to time, so I feel okay talking about them, where the um, to do home-based interventions to prevent asthma. And so they're hoping to launch a major uh, initiative in East Baltimore around that. Um, I think that uh, Hopkins has been on this new system for about a year or so, a little more, um, and uh, there are one of the other things Hopkins, you know, Hopkins is, uh, I think this is really the moment for Johns Hopkins community physicians and a lot of the primary care folks at Hopkins are getting more resources to do more things and are very excited about it when I go talk to them, but I think that it's this, the system is harder for a diffused organization that still has a lot of um, uh, physicians who are paid fee for service. One of the challenges in Maryland is that the physician fees aren't totally aligned with the hospital budgets, and that's a challenge for the bigger hospitals. But I do think you can see every time I'm over on the medical side, I, I manage to cross the street, I hear about something new going on that seems promising. I want to follow up with questions that have been asked already about um, 
the reduction of admissions. Uh, I worked in the federal healthcare system for 25 years, and in the 1990s, my hospital tried that where we would be rewarded for fewer admissions. And uh, one year after each incremental reward, our budget went down. Mm -hmm. We had to release uh, ancillary personnel, and then the clinicians who were had divided appointments where they were doing some research and some clinical work, there were fewer clinicians uh, in the department, and the remaining clinicians spent more time in the clinical service. So it wound up paradoxically reversing itself by reducing um, the margin and increasing the workload per individual. Um, so I would be the first person to say that the management of these kind of incentives is absolutely critical, particularly at the state level. One thing that Maryland has going for it is that there's a 40-year tradition of rate setting and trust between the regulator and the hospital. So when the regulator says, we're going to let you keep the revenue if you're reducing preventable emissions, the hospitals believe it. And they also have examples from the pilot hospitals where they have been able to keep it. So, um, you know, um, I used to joke with the hospital CEOs, uh, my jokes went over about as well as they did here, but I would say that, like, um, you know, I can absolutely assure you there will be no unintended consequences to this new policy, you know, and there'll be, like, no laughs. Like, that was a joke, you know. But the, 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 um, there are all kinds of challenges when you switch payment systems, but the current payment system really stinks for health. We do not have good health in the United States. We have a fee-for-service system that has, you know, created a massive medical sector that is underperforming. And so it makes, and there's an imperative because of cost to switch, but we have to be smart about how we do that. And that doesn't mean you don't, you know, recognize that there are all kinds of pitfalls along the way. Uh, thanks so much, Dr. Sharfstein, for coming. Um, we could continue this conversation in West Wing 3.5, Suite 500, um, in the small conference room. For, and if anyone's available for some breakfast as well. Thanks again. Thanks.